Welcome everyone to week three of the actions in regenerative soil. I'm your host, Matt Powers in this epic journey, micro to macro connecting soil to everything. And we've, we've seen the cycles. We've seen the plant side, the soil side, the microbe side, the mineral side, and we put it all together. And now we are looking at the actions and seeing how they would fit into our system, our garden, our climate, and our context, and coming up with a plan, taking notes as we go, but coming up with a plan on what we can do for our site. So thank you for being here. Let's begin. This week, we're going to be covering a lot of guest teacher videos. We have a lot of extra help teaching this week. This is going to be a short overview of a lot of the things that are going to be covered in many ways in terms of creating natural farming or natural farming. But we are going to learn from a lot of these examples and you've got lifetime access so you can come back over and over and over again and learn deeper and deeper as you see the connections between the sites, between the learning, between the science, putting it all together and seeing how you can apply it on your site, on your farm, on your situation. I'm so excited to be here with you. Let's begin. So what is natural farming? Well, Cho Han Q, natural farming expert, actually wrote this book with his daughter and his teachers, his book does not have citations. It does not have references. So it talks about microbes uh, with no reference as to where he learned about them. But he did go to agricultural school in Korea and then he went to Japan to learn more natural farming techniques. And he learned from these gentlemen and natural farming, his version of natural farming, what some people call Korean natural farming is actually a combination of these three teachers and their methods. And so this is what's credited in that book from them in the 2008 updated version. So it's, it's really, really valuable to know that this is a tradition of agriculture and maybe perhaps a, a little bit like what, what happened in Europe when uh, modern agriculture arrived. So the philosophy and practice was Cho. Uh, some people call him Master Cho. And he is the father in this equation. And he's the one who uh, questioned conventional ag and went to Japan and learned natural farming and brought it back and created a practice. But he didn't create specific recipes and preps. That was done when they formalized it with his daughter and they wrote down everything. And so that's why she partnered with him on that. But he was the one practicing. He's the recipe guy. And for many of us, when we create things and when we get really fluent at things, we tend to eyeball it. We tend to do it by hand and by feel. And formalizing into recipes can sometimes be hard for certain people, especially innovators, especially people who are really deeply connected to the landscape, to the plants, to the soil. So, so the, the, for me, uh, this makes a lot of sense that that's how th that they work together. IMOs are biological samplings, selections, and compost fermentations. These indigenous microorganisms are more than just a sampling of organisms. They're a specific sampling. So there's a selection process going on. And then they're used strategically as inputs in composting and as well as inputs in foliar sprays and soil soaks for, for plants and soils. The inputs are primarily organic matter plus vinegar or sugar. And there is one alcohol preserve. So Korean natural farming or natural farming preps are food preservation and fermentation techniques applied to amendment creation for farming. So if you can preserve foods in a kitchen, you can make any of the natural farming recipes. So it really begs the question, is Master Cho like a Rudolf Steiner where he gathered all these natural farming techniques, uh, these Japanese farmers, natural uh, farming techniques and gathered them and created uh, the scientific backing, connected it all so that he could create a cohesive 
farming methodology for to the world. It's pretty incredible. It seems very similar. Um, there's probably, as always, more to the story. But before we begin down this road, because there's going to be a lot of acronyms, a lot of shortening of words into just their first letter of each word, a lot of people get overwhelmed um, with all the new vocabulary and abbreviations and acronyms. So before we get anywhere any further, I want you to know that this is the chart. This chart tells you their benefit, their timing, and their use. So that no matter the prep, you know what it's good for and this can guide you. You can look it up. You can use it. You can plan it out. You don't need to memorize any of these things because you've got that reference, my book, and you've got this chart to help organize you and to create your own soil management plan. Your soil management plan will likely feature some of these things um, if you're into this kind of management style. Uh, natural farming is a, is a very specific management style, but if you've got a lot of organic matter, a lot of organic waste, it's an excellent one. Hot compost is different, um, but there are similarities, and, and hmm, you'll see a lot of similarities between all these things, and that's good because that'll allow you to think about them dynamically so that you can create your own methods and pretty soon maybe you'll be featured you know as an add-on to this course a new video on this course with your new methodology your new bio fertilizer mix you know your new composting method or soil management technique and that's awesome bring it on i'm excited about it because it's it's it, it, it's bound to happen it should happen and in this community where we're it's this fertile community of discussion and thought and collaboration and support. This is the place where new ideas are going to take root and we're going to discuss and test and, and prove out so many things. So I'm excited to be part of this. I'm excited that you're part of this. Um, and just keep this in mind that no matter how overwhelming it gets, you know when things are going to happen. You have things that you can do at different time periods and you can fix what's lacking. You can treat plants for what's missing throughout with foliar sprays. And you can also have a program for feeding your plants and your soil throughout the season. And I recommend doing them all. Korean natural farming is not just pre preparation of the soil, but it's how to feed the plants throughout the season. And for many people doing high demand crops like cannabis or grapes or, or other things, they're going to trigger different, different stages and they're going to try to time all of their spraying and foliar spray and soil soaks to be just before the next stage. So they're like actually drawing it in and then supercharging these transitions. Because the transitions, if you can focus on making your transitions faster, it makes you overall faster. It's like in sports, you know, it's it, it, it's the the transition moves, the the way you, you know, the ball changes hands, the way you switch, you know, the stick to different hands. Those kind of transition moves are actually the moments of the most lag. And with plants and growth, it's the same sort of way. Any lag in mineral nutrition, any lag in... in and water, too much water, all these kinds of things will cause a, a stunt in the growth or a lag or a pause or a open door to a problem. But with a combination of a plan for feeding, for managing, for replenishing the soil during, before, and after, and in the off season is a best practice. And that kind of thoroughness is going to give you the best possible crops, the best possible soil. And over time, n not that long, I mean, it depends on your soil and your climate. Um, but, but over time, your soil is going to get so good that the microbes themselves, the amino sugar nitrogen, 
that's coming from chitin. That's coming from fungal bodies. And that's coming from insects and other organisms that are larger and chitin based in the soil food web. So it's a really vibrant life. And at a certain point, enough organic matter, enough minerals, enough exchange, they start pulling from the minerals and breaking down the minerals efficiently. Our work becomes way less. And at that point, we're making compost that hugs to the zone. We're making, you know, foliar sprays that make it so that we're really not taking from the land. We're feeding the plants in situ. We're getting the, uh, the microbes really vibrant and healthy, but we're not robbing the soil of nutrients any longer. Instead, it's this wondrous, continuous abundance and growth and complexity and enrichment of the soil as the plants are growing at the same time. So that, that's really what regenerative soil is. It's this resilient, regeneratively bulletproof soil that allows us to season after season grow with less and less inputs, but we still have to provide a return for what we're doing and taking, but the plants, when in an alignment, bring so much in, in terms of carbon and nitrogen, that they, 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 it's so powerful. And because they're feeding the microbes, they're releasing the nutrients from the soil profile, from the minerals, and the pebbles, and the rocks, and the clays, and the silts, and the sand, that those things that are there at trace levels are available. So it is the case that if we get to a certain threshold, all these things will be less relevant um, in terms of like the numbers. Like we won't have to use as much and, and we can skip and we can miss and we can go light. Um, we can take it easy. You know what I mean? Because we've created a self perpetuating system. That's what the natural order is, is a self perpetuating system. And nature wants to do that. That's what regenerative is. And if we can just facilitate that, it'll just take off. So don't feel like you have to have to do every little thing all the time forever. But if you put in the time and work, if you put in the investment and you go up front with heavy loading it up front, not, not necessarily putting like a ton of like minerals or, or rock dust down or something like that. I just mean like you spend the next several years per perpetually keeping the heat on and, and doing a lot of work, getting that organic matter up getting all those minerals in there, getting your soils coherent, getting your paramagnetism up, that is going to cause a momentum that will carry you for years and require much less input over time. And it will remain so as long as you obey, you know, the, the, the rules of natural, natural soil. IMO preps, indigenous microorganism preps, these are primarily endophytes and saprophytes. All right, so I am a one. Chris Trump is the master of all these. He is the, the, the chef in the kitchen, and I am a student of natural farming. I appreciate it. I really appreciate the science, the example, the inspiration, what it opens the door for, because it is food preservation techniques, so it's stuff that's familiar, but it's being applied in a way that's new and not familiar. So it's really cool, but it's also something that I want to genetically test and get a better idea of who's who, when and where, so we can delve into this. But that all being said, you're going to learn these techniques directly from Chris. He's got videos online. I'm going to post them here inside the course so that you can learn directly from him any of these techniques but i want you to pay attention to what i say here because it's going to give you a strategy around them that's going to link it to everything we've learned so his work he's going to talk strictly from a natural farming strictly from a cho perspective but chris and i have long conversations about elaine ingham he was a student of hers and 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 Cho and all the stuff that I work on and tying it all together. So uh, I, 
I, I provide that information and links today so that when you study from him, you can have a full connection to everything else. So IMO ones, we're going out into wild fertile areas and collecting biology in a, a box, this slatted, you know, wooden box that allows for microbiology to come into this rice and inoculate it. And so this like rice that hasn't been fully cooked is in this box, got a paper top or a paper towel covering stapled on. You, you put it, you know, under, under a tree or somewhere really fertile, really fungal. You wait three to five days later, we're going to look for that white fluffy mold and it's completely inoculated. It's all fluffy white mycelium just sticking right out like, like crazy hair, just poof out of the rice. Now it can be a little bit of colors here and there, but primarily it should be white. Now you can, if it's all perfectly white and there's a section that that looks nasty, you can cut that part out and take the rest. But I am a one is a collection. So it's, it's collecting from the natural soils and the natural ecosystem the saprophytes that attach to the white rice. And, and the crazy thing is we're going to take that and then isolate it with sugar. And I say isolate is that we're only going to feed certain microbes and we're going to put others into an insisted state and others we're just going to kill. Before we get into that, I want to talk about this next one. So you're like, that's amazing. Can we get other samplings? You can. Endophytic IMO1 is totally possible. So you could be doing grasses. You could be adding that same rice that's not fully cooked, flipped on top of rice or grasses or corn or sorghum or anything. And the exudates that, that are literally going to just exude from the center stalks and from the cut, you know, phloem and xylem of that plant are going to go directly into that rice and inoculate it. You cover it up, put some rocks on top. Same thing with bamboo. You can go and you can get the microbes that are inside these plants and you can collect those microbes and then scale it up. Now, IMO2, you combine it with sugar. At this point, you could do other things. You don't necessarily have to even put it in in a sugar bath you don't necessarily have to put it into rice you could be cutting stalks and taking samples and putting them directly onto petri dishes you could be doing so many different things obviously then you're gonna have a mix of biology and you have to isolate things and then genetically id things and then amplify them uh, as to the foods that they prefer but we're combining brown sugar with the imo one one to one and it creates IMO2, which is a selection and a, a, a freezing of a selection of the biology. So you're promoting, you're growing certain amounts of biology, you're pausing, you know, freezing certain amount of the biology, osmotic shock, you know, it's a selection process. You created this, it's shelf stable, now IMO3. You're gonna combine that and essentially create a Bokashi with IMO3 here using the IMO2. So it's an inoculant, but it's also kind of like an accelerant or a catalyst because it's biology with sugar. So it's got this powerful, powerful um, potential to it. So you could be making something like a compost with this with IMO3. And then IMO4 is even more like compost, but it it takes in even more IMOs at the same time. So you take IMO3, which you created with IMO2, it has that sugar in there, then you can combine it with field soil and native ecosystem soil from a variety of ecosystems. And then you're gonna combine it and put all these inputs into it. So FPJ, FFJ, LAB, lab, and, and or FAA. Now. It's all diluted, but we'll get into what those are. But basically, you're putting a cocktail of different inputs from natural farming into this pile. So you're supercharging it with vinegars and sugars with the microbiology essentially um, locked in stasis 
or selected for to be feeders on sugar. And so you put them in there and, and you're essentially doing what EM does, but combining it with an EM extension where you're training it, feeding it on food and promoting it at the same time. So this is like adding molasses to your compost. Not even your compost tea adding molasses, adding molasses to your compost to speed up the process. This is pretty wild. So um, you could be doing that. Have you ever heard of people doing that? Adding molasses water down to their compost to speed up their composting? I don't know if I have, but I can totally see how effective that would be. And I think I'm going to do it. <laughs> to see how fast I can speed things up because it sounds brilliant. And instead of EM, you know, putting a governor on things, uh, we can instead continuously feed that biology and um, probably speed things up and turn and water to keep it within the right temperature range, but still smooth out the, the inconsistencies of food for the, for the microbes. So, so it speeds up the entire process. Tangent, I know, but you see how talking about these preps in a way that connects them, way that generalizes them to their components, allows us to start improvising and creating our own adaptations. I want you to do that. I don't want us to be locked into any dogma. I don't want us to be locked into any specifics necessarily. We can start there. We can rely upon things. Uh, I've, I've done the research. We can rely upon these things. I'm not saying don't rely upon them. But what I am saying is be prepared. Give yourself the freedom and opportunity and respect and confidence to start adapting, improvising and thinking broadly about these and interconnectedly about these because you're going to come up with things. I mean, the fact that I can just start talking about them and improvising here on the fly just off the cuff, I had no plans to talk about molasses assisted, you know, water diluted molasses assisted compost. It just came to me naturally from looking at this. So IMO4, there's diluted seawater in this. So you could be doing ocean minerals with a little bit of molasses, maybe um, some compost tea, and uh, you could be uh, improving your compost at the same time, taking a nod from this. So it only ferments for two days. It's really incredible. It kind of hints at what's possible for us and applying it to other things. So IMO4 is amazing. And then IMO5, have I mentioned before black soldier fly larvae is like so hot that it's like sort of not compost. It's more of a, an amendment to compost. Well, if you have really, really hot manure, really wet manure like black soldier fly larvae, you could be adding it, combining it with IMO4 that's finished and allowing that to ferment for a week, that fermentation process takes it down really fast into a stable compost that you can then just add to the soil, to the garden. It's incredible. So it cools off quickly. It's a really high paced way of composting, but it also, again, opens a door and opens a new way of seeing a lot of this stuff because essentially that was a boosted compost IMO4 that was added to a really, really nitrogenous um, amendment, and then that composted extra fast. So really vibrant compost is not just a finished product that you could be using in compost tea or in the garden. It's something that you could be then going back to the beginning of the decomposition process for something else and adding it in or using it as a mother pile to feed your other composts. So I just want us to like open our minds to what's possible in that regard as well. Now, one to 1,000, this is something that's going to come up over and over again with these preps because that's how they dilute everything. So here's a handy-dandy chart. It's in the book. You can use this, and that will get you everything that you need in the amounts that you need. Diluted seawater, I mentioned this earlier. You can make your own. You can follow this chart if you've got access to seawater, or you can use sea salt to create your own. 
Regenerative soil is the breakthrough that farmers and gardeners all over the world are using to unlock the full potential of their plants and soils. Universities are doubling their yields. Farmers are increasing their water holding capacity by thousands of gallons of water per acre per year. Gardeners are seeing pest pressure disappear and evaporate. The most challenging aspects of growing food are being addressed by focusing on the linchpin to all life, the soil. If we can get our soil right, we can grow amazing food, raise amazing animals, and overcome all of these challenges. We skip the pests, the diseases, the viruses, and soil damage. We instead focus on making things better and better. So our food, yields, and nutrition continue to improve exponentially with every single season. Learn to understand soil from the micro to the macro, down to the individual microbes, ions, and enzymes, and how they directly relate to hands-on action and pragmatic strategies for our farms, fields, and gardens. We can grow food faster with higher yields and nutritional density, but it all comes down and comes back to your soil. Is it resilient? Is it regenerative? Join us and change the way you see the world, food, soils, and everything and how it relates. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. And click that link. Join us this season. Don't miss out.